This strange looking disc is an absolute position encoder, and it's really neat. I made a YouTube short about it a few weeks ago, and it's now my most viewed video ever. From the comments, I could tell that many people still misunderstood the purpose and application of the disc, so let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. For the scope of this video, an encoder is an electromechanical device that can sense things around it, typically motion, and can provide feedback based on that motion. So what am I using the encoder for, and why did I need to make this weirdly patterned disc? Well, what I wanted to build was an anemometer. Anemometers are devices that measure the wind, and as such, they have two components, because the wind does too. Speed and direction. So you have wind cups for measuring the wind speed and a wind vane for measuring the direction. Essentially what I'm building here is a digital wind vane. Towards the end of my YouTube short, when I explained that I was making an anemometer so that I could know which direction the wind was blowing, I asked somewhat in jest if there was an easier way that I could have done this. To which I had a ton of snarky comments saying things like, a wind sock, uh, licking your thumb and sticking it out in the wind. Or my personal favorite, looking at the bushes. The obvious advantage to having a digital anemometer is that it can log data for me automatically, and then I can go back and review it as necessary. So, what's with the weird disk? What are the alternatives and why don't I use them? One of the first thing that comes to mind is a potentiometer. A potentiometer is a type of variable resistor, and it can be classified as a rotary encoder, since the resistance changes as you spin the shaft. Common potentiometers only spin about 270 degrees though, so not only is there this 25% dead zone, but it could also get stuck such that the wind was blowing it one direction, but it couldn't move any further past where it already was. As you can see from my poor drawing skills, potentiometers have a sort of wiper, that as you spin it, the wiper moves further away from the contact point, which increases the resistance. I drew the brown ring to represent resistive material, and just like how a longer hose is harder to pump water through than a short hose, having a longer segment of resistive material has more resistance than a shorter segment. Here's a variation that I drew on the traditional potentiometer. I made this one so that it could spin 360 degrees, but the only thing is that there'd be a little spot where there's no connectivity between pin 1 and the end of the resistive material. That's totally fine though, because if you're doing something like this, you kind of want a reference point anyway, so you could point the point at which there's no connectivity as north, and then, you know, calculate resistance values as follows. The reason I didn't use this potentiometer though, is because I searched far and wide, and as far as I can tell, it does not exist. Neither does anything like it. So this probably would have been the easiest solution, but as far as I can tell, it's out of the question. And then I had a lot of people say, well, why don't you use trimming potentiometers? Because those can spin as many times as they want. There's a couple problems with trimming potentiometers. The first is that the shaft is really tiny, and I think it'd be kind of hard to design something that fits in there and stays tight. That's not the biggest problem, though. Trimming potentiometers can't actually spin forever. Well, they can spin forever, but you're going to reach a certain point where spinning it no longer increases the resistance. Inside trimming potentiometers, there's a little tiny worm gear and a sperm gear. <laughs> Inside trimming potentiometers, there's a little worm gear and a spur gear. And after about 10 turns, you reach a point where spinning the shaft will no longer change the resistance. So when that happens, it becomes useless as a position encoder because it is no longer providing feedback based off of the motion. Here's another really common encoder that many hobbyists are familiar with. Specifically, this is an incremental rotary encoder. And I had a lot of people suggest that I use one of these for my digital wind vane. These are often colloquially called rotary encoders. But the incremental part is important. Here's a little setup that I made to mimic the working principle of an incremental rotary encoder. You can see that I have two lights, red and green, and a disc that has holes in it. Pretend for a moment that you're a dumb computer, and you can't actually conceptualize this setup. All you know is when a light turns on, and when a light turns off. The lights aren't actually turning on and off, they're just being hidden from your view, right? So I spin it just a little bit in this way, and the red light disappears from view. The computer would have to know that it's spinning clockwise, because the red light disappeared first. If it was spinning counterclockwise, the green light would have had to have turned off first. Next, the green light disappears from view, and we can safely say that it was turned clockwise a little bit more. We also know that because both lights are off, we have fully entered into the next phase. And since each phase is about a quarter turn, we know that we are at most a quarter turn from where we started. The problem with using a rotary encoder for this purpose comes when you try to map the rotations to cardinal directions. Rotary encoders don't know where they are. They just know when they've been spun. With some clever programming, you can make it remember where it is, but the thing is that requires the device to be powered on all the time, because it's committing the location to memory. Every time it spins, it has to update the new location in memory. It has to constantly remember where it is at the last point. And if it loses power, even for an instant, it's going to forget where it is and it's not going to know until it's recalibrated. This issue can be alleviated somewhat if you add an absolute reference. This is a prototype that I made several months ago for a wind vane that uses a rotary encoder and an end switch as its reference. You can see that the bit of plastic that's attached to the rotary encoder has sort of a knob or like an egg shape protruding off of it. That little protrusion is just wide enough that it will close the end switch. So you can calibrate this physically such that the end switch is pointing north, and that way you know that every time that connection is closed, the wind vane must be pointing north. 
The downside to this is that it still is going to require constant power to work. If it loses power, it does have the ability to recalibrate itself, but the device is going to have to wait until at least one click of the end switch is made. And if, for example, you have wind blowing consistently from east to west and it never touches north, it's not going to calibrate until who knows when. This, as well as the power concerns, is why I really wanted to try the absolute position encoding disk. You can probably already see now the advantage of having the data coded physically rather than digitally. This allows it to be able to be completely unpowered for indefinite period of time and still provide accurate readings. It can be calibrated once and provide data forever, so long as the device is physically undisturbed. So let's take a closer look at what drives this intentional but seemingly random patterning. The encoding disk is divided into rings. Each ring is divided into smaller and smaller segments the further you get from the center of the disk. That's because this disk is coded in binary, and the outermost ring represents the ones place. When you count in binary, the ones place will alternate between 0 and 1 with every single increment. Hence on this disk, the outermost ring is alternating every smallest segment. We can use the disk to count in binary because the disk is going to have only one of two states at every segment. There's either going to be material, or there's not going to be material. Taking the first slice of the disk here, we can see that there's no material in any of the segments, so the reading is therefore 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The slice adjacent to it, however, reads 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, because material is present in the segment of the outermost ring. One ring on this disk is basically equivalent to a bit of information. So however many bits you have is going to determine how finely segmented your disk is. My encoder has 5 bits, 5 rings, and so it therefore has 2 to the exponent of 5 positions, which is 32. This means that my disk is accurate to 360 divided by 32 degrees, which is 11.25. And with wind direction, I think that's about as good as I'm going to need. My weather app on my phone is only accurate to 45 degrees, so my anemometer will hopefully read with 4 times the precision. In my prototypes for the absolute position encoding disk, I've been using photoresistors, which are a type of component whose resistance across the two legs changes based on the amount of light present. I created a reading arm for the encoder that was approximately one segment wide, and added five spots for five different photoresistors. My hope was that segments of the disk where there was material present would block enough of the ambient light in the room that you would be able to get a good reading, but that didn't end up quite being the case. A human could fairly easily see which bits were high and which bits were low, and the issue probably could have been coded out, but I'm not the best coder, and I was worried about misreadings, so instead I thought of ways to widen the gap between the high and low readings. As with pretty much all good things in life, the solution was lasers. Lasers shining focused beams of light directly onto the photoresistors led to readings that were so stark that it was impossible to mistake. I should mention that the red absolute encoding disk that you saw in the YouTube short was my version 1, this green one is my version 2, and the one with lasers, the black disk, is my version 3. There was another big change from version 2 to version 3 that I haven't talked about yet. It was the single most suggested thing on my YouTube short, with literally thousands of people commenting about it. That suggestion was to recode the disk, and rather than using binary as I've done before, to use what is called gray code, which is essentially a remapping of binary, but for a specific reason. You run into a problem with binary, just like in the decimal system where, let's say for example you have the number 9999, and you add only one to it, well suddenly every single digit's value changes, rather than it being 09999, it's now 10000. Every single one changed. Gray code is a remapping of binary such that every time you add 1 to it to increment, there is no more than one value in the string of numbers that changes. Here are the binary and gray code values for the numbers 7 and 8. You can see that where binary completely changes, gray code still only changes by 1. This is, in hindsight, imperative for this disk, because the values don't change instantly. You can see here that when I turn the disk very slowly, the output that is read from the photoresistors does not change instantly. The photoresistors are never simply 0 or 1. The photoresistors provide a resistance value based on the amount of light present. And light is an incredibly gradient thing. So there's actually a pretty significant possibility that when I grab a reading from the encoding disk, it's actually between two readings. It hasn't fully changed from one segment to the other. If that happens on the binary disk, there's a pretty strong possibility that I'm going to get a number that is nowhere near the number that I thought that I was going to get. With gray code, however, each segment is only different from the segment adjacent to it by a maximum of one value. So even if I get a mix-matched, you know, it's not all the way moved from one segment to the other, it'll at least be in the ballpark. It'll at least be very, very close to what it's supposed to be, rather than being all over the map like the binary disk would be. And finally, I have one last thing to address before I actually show you the absolute position encoder in action, which I venture to say will probably be the least interesting part of this video. I think the most interesting thing is, is learning about all these things. But I wanted to say, there were some people that asked why I didn't just use, there are chips that can sense like perpendicular magnetic fields to the chip. So you can just use one of those and, and you know, you twist the magnet and, and it can tell you which, which direction the field is facing. And that's a very simple solution and one that works. And I had all these people saying, well, why didn't you just do that? And my answer, at the risk of sounding pretentious, is just because I didn't want to.
It didn't sound like fun to do it that way. I wanted to do it the fun way. That's sort of the novelty of Christopher's factory is that Christopher doesn't run his factory in the way that most people would, or even that an efficient or a, you know, a proper factory would. I do things the way that I want. And I do things the way that I think is fun. I, I do things the way that I think will teach me the most and that I will have the most fun doing. So the retort to that one, there's no practical reason that I, that I chose not to use the, uh, the magnetic field sensing chip. But the reason is just because I didn't want to. And I, you know, for my channel, I, I think that's a, a good enough reason for me. I just didn't want to. I thought this was more fun. One thing that I'm going to do, I think, in the near future, if I don't get bored of these, these encoding discs, is I wanted to do one in trinary. So I was thinking you could print, 3D print like three layers of discs and then, you know, have something that like sandwiches together so that it's like the, so that it's like the encoding pattern, but rather than using, you know, holes, material present versus not present, you use different colors. And then you use sensors that can sense the color of the light being reflected into the sensor to tell you what, what color is facing. So I thought it'd be interesting to do a trinary disc. I, I think it would also probably look cooler. So that's a little something for the future unless I lose steam on encoding discs the way that I did with spirographs. As always, I will post the STLs that I used for this project on my Thingiverse profile, and I will have links in the description to all of the relevant tools, products, uh, lasers, stuff like that that I used for this project. This is already my favorite video on my channel, and I haven't even posted it yet, so I, I hope it was for you as well. And even if not, I thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.